Welcome everyone. We'll give it a couple minutes before we get started with the webinar. Thank you for joining us. Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this pumpkin growers panel webinar hosted by Harris Seeds and Harris Moran. My name is Kristen Noble. I am the vegetable product manager at Harris Seeds and I will be moderating this webinar. The idea for this grower panels webinar was inspired by the pumpkin growing questions that we have received um, on our professional growers Facebook group. We thought this would be a good opportunity for you to hear from your peers regarding their growing practices and their experiences in different marketplaces. We've organized the questions into groups and we'll be asking our panelists to respond. And if time allows, we will also field some questions at the end of the webinar. Additional questions that you all have submitted um, live today. So we'll kick off with some housekeeping. This webinar will be recorded and will be available by the end of this week. It'll be accessible on the Harris Seeds YouTube channel and attendees will also receive uh, an email with the link to the webinar recording. Uh, all attendees are muted and your video is not shared. If you have questions, please use the Q&A section to submit those questions. Uh, if we have time at the end of the webinar, we will address as many of those questions as possible. If you have any concerns um, with being able to hear the webinar uh, or anything to that effect, you can use the chat for that, but please submit your questions through the Q&A so we can keep track of them there. At the end of the uh, webinar, there will be a short three question survey that we ask you to complete, and that helps us understand um, how you liked the webinar and if there's anything that we can do better in the future. We will also be doing a pumpkin seed raffle with a drawing at the end of the webinar. So one attendee will receive 1000 seeds of a Harris Moran pumpkin variety free of charge. Uh, and the variety will be of your choice. This is courtesy of Harris Moran and we thank them for that contribution. So stick around to the end of the webinar to see if you were selected as the lucky winner of this raffle. So to, to get started, we'll have James Daly of Harris Moran introduce himself, as well as some new varieties that we're excited to tell you about before we get started with the panel. I'll pass it off to you, James. All right, thank you, Kristen. So my name is James Daly. I'm the uh, pumpkin breeder for HM Klaus. So I've been with the company since 2018. Um, I'd have to say, you know, back in 2006, I was, I was kind of a flailing biology student thinking about, you know, pre-med or whatever, not super excited about it. And a rice breeder came and spoke to us and, um, and I just was really enthralled with the idea of doing something very practical, staying very close to the science, but pursuing a career in plant breeding. And that really set me, set me on my path. Um, finished school in, in Utah, moved to South Carolina, did school with my wife at Clemson University, and then uh, finished my PhD at, at North Carolina State University in horticultural science with an emphasis in plant breeding and plant genetics. Um, I have, I, th I think one of the most interesting careers, I'm, I'm based here in Davis, I should say, I was asked to, to mention that, but I'm based here in Davis, California. Um, but I get, my job is to come up with new, novel, improved varieties of pumpkins and, and also butternut squash. Um, so it's, it's an exciting thing. It's a really fun career path. I get to spend a lot of time outside and I get to you know, work with growers. And I, I have to say right off the bat, it's, it's really an honor to be with everybody here. 
I have a lot of respect for growers and I, I look forward to opportunities like this to really to, to speak with you and to learn from you. Um, this, is, this is where the rubber meets the road and you all are out there making it happen. So it's, a, it's an honor to be with you and it's a pleasure to be with you. Kristen, go ahead and next slide, please. So as Kristen mentioned, we have some new pumpkins. I was asked to very briefly introduce new pumpkins for 2022. Two of them were actually 2021, 2021, but we're gonna call them new for 2022. Um, these two certainly are, are pumpkins you should uh, take a moment to consider. Um, these are large pumpkins, what we would consider our specialty class pumpkins. So you can see the size, we start on the left there, Olympus. Um, it's a 25 to 35 pound pumpkin in the same vein of, as Kronos, if you've had experience with Kronos. Um, the main difference between Kronos and Olympus is Olympus is a little bit smaller. I think it's a much more attractive pumpkin, has a much smoother look to it, has that same big handle, that same kind of squatty, large look to it. But the adaptation on Olympus is really, really, is, is vastly improved over Kronos. Kronos is a, is a great pumpkin. It grows very well, and it's a beautiful, large pumpkin, but it can be temperamental. And so one of the breeding focuses with Olympus was let's get a pumpkin that has much wider adaptation than Kronos that will help, that will deliver that premium pumpkin, something that you can put, put out in a consumer, a direct to retail operation, or maybe even a bidding operation that will fetch a premium price. So shifting over to Adonis, and I got to say among, you know, like children, you shouldn't have favorites, but I, I really, Adonis has got to be one of my favorites. It is a beautiful barrel shaped pumpkin, tall, and it's big. Um, the, the size, the weight range we give here is 25 to 40 pounds, whereas Olympus was, would throw maybe 29 pounders, almost 30 pounders in Davis. This one, we frequently had 30 plus 40 pound pumpkins. And, and every year I would make it a point to go through the Adonis plots, pick out the big, cherry pick the biggest, most beautiful pumpkin and take that one home and put it on my porch. Um, really, a, you have to see it in the field to really appreciate it, but it's, it's almost got these cartoonishly large shoulders on it with these, these nice, beautiful ribs. Something you should, absolutely should consider. Um, go and advance to the next slide, Kristen. So moving into more of a decorative class and, and all these pumpkins, the, the bread and butter of what we do at HM, HM Klaus is, are those the binning pumpkins. So the specialty pumpkins, these decorative pumpkins really round out that portfolio. Um, popcorn is, is new. We're pretty excited about this one. Um, it somewhat speaks for itself, this, this cream colored warded pumpkin. Um, one of the main efforts from a breeding background, one of the main things we're looking at is we're looking at many different iterations of, of potential popcorn candidates was, were those warts. So warts tend to be a liability in warty pumpkins. They tend to be soft, they tend to be damage prone. Um, popcorn relative to other iterations had more, I would say rupture resistance or damage resistant warts. They are still soft and you still have to be careful with them but it did much, much better than other versions that we were looking at. So in general, just background, the, the, the shell you see in the background there on that pumpkin, kind of the, the smooth rind surface you're seeing, that's hard shell, tends to be hard shell in these, these warty pumpkins. But those warts that come out are soft, just, just like soft, like a normal carving pumpkin. So handling, you know, it, they're, they're prone to damage. So again, you gotta be careful with them. But so one consideration for pump, popcorn was again, that, that kind of, damage resilient, you know, ward, something that's going to be able to take a little bit more of the handling and not, not show the damage. Um, shifting gears, Pixie on the right here. So we're moving all the way down to a little half pound pumpkin. We have several of these, what we'd consider a munchkin or mini munchkin type or mini type pumpkins in the portfolio. But Pixie sits itself different by combining a hard shell trait. So hard shell means it, it's a, a really a, a good way to check for it. So can you puncture it, puncture it with your fingernail at maturity? Um, it's going to be much more resilient for shipping purposes, as well as, and I, I, sh I should have brought it, I have one on sitting at my desk and it's, you can dry them out and you can shake it and hear the seeds inside. So it, it dries out kind of like a gourd. So for long, long excuse me, long-term storage or, or decoration, there could be a, an option there for it. But the key thing with Pixie is that it combines that hard shell with a precocious yellow trait. And your sign for the precocious yellow, if you look very closely at this picture, right at the base of the handle, right at the base of the peduncle, you have this slight yellowing in the handle. And that's, that's your telltale sign of a precocious yellow pumpkin. Orange Sunrise, which is a, a larger binning pumpkin that we sell also has that precocious yellow trait. Um, so you'll see a little bit of that yellow bleeding into the handle. The advantages with that trait are, are twofold. One is from an earliest standpoint, earliness standpoint, you don't have to wait for color 
Color doesn't seem to be an issue. So it never passes through a green stage of development. It goes from yellow to orange. Um, you've got to be careful you don't pick it too early. So watch the other maturity indicators, the firmness, the hardening off of the handle, the firmness of the flesh. Make sure you don't pick it too early just because it's colored up. But the key advantage here in, in this munchkin type, and one of the reasons why we focused on developing a precocious yellow mini was, from, was for virus. Um, viral symptoms on these munchkins tend to manifest as these green rings or this green flecking on the fruit. With pixie, because it doesn't pass through that green stage of development, those symptoms are largely masked. So the, the plant is susceptible to the virus, but you don't see the symptoms so much on the fruit. Um, and I, I wish we had a good side-by-side -side picture to show you because it's, it's pretty dramatic. If I had munchkin, just this old traditional munchkin variety with virus symptoms on it next to a pixie, you would see some pretty clear differences. Um, so a really an innovative trait for a, an, an older product. Um, next slide, please. Kristen, oh, thank you. So these were technically 2021. We, we were selling some of these, but it's, it's really the main, main releases for 2022. Um, lemonade on the left here, beautiful golden yellow pumpkin. I, the, the neat thing about lemonade in, in particular is that it's, it's sized up such that it's a carving class. So it, it could be a carving pumpkin as well as just a, a fall decorative pumpkin. So really neat options with, with lemonade, a beautiful pumpkin. Um, fireball on the right here, also really interesting pumpkin. And this one brings uh, that hard shell I mentioned earlier with pixie. So it's, it's very resilient. It's, it's not something you would carve. So we, don't, we wouldn't sell it as a carving pumpkin, but some, something that would certainly, again, round out that fall decorative portfolio or even bleed into that Halloween season as something that would sit next to a, a good jack-o'-lantern. So new pumpkins, um, it's, it's been an exciting couple of years for H.M. Klaus, or excuse me, for the, in the world of pumpkin. I mean, COVID and you know, world affairs notwithstanding, at least in the world of pumpkin, things have been going pretty well. And we're, we're pretty excited about these releases as well as you know, other interesting things coming through the portfolio. So thank you. Great, thank you, James. We're really excited to be able to offer these new varieties at Harris Seeds. Um, and you can find them on the Harris Seeds website and please reach out if you have any additional questions about these. Uh, so now we'll transition into the intros for the rest of our panelists. So we're very excited to have uh, different professional pumpkin growers from around the U.S. on our panel to speak to you all today. Um, and please keep in mind as they are discussing their practices that um, they are professional growers. So we may have some home gardeners on the call today and certainly we're excited to have you here, but keep in mind that some of the practices they may be doing are um, of a different scale than what you would use in your home garden. Um, so we'll kick it off first with Jeremy, if you would please introduce yourself, Jeremy East. I'm Jeremy East with East Farms. Uh, like it says, we're in Northern Utah, just North of Salt Lake. Um, we have 500 acres up here. We do about 150 acres of pumpkins and specialty pumpkins and winter squash, um, selling them a lot of it wholesale. Uh, we started retailing um, through some stands that my wife set up last year called Basic Witches Pumpkins. Um, and then we sell a lot to other farms that uh, have gone that do the agritourism and stuff like that. So I've been growing my whole life, um, 25 years on my own. So, yeah. Great, thank you, Jeremy. We're happy to have you today. Uh, next, we'll have Doug Joyer introduce himself. Hello, I'm Doug Joyer from Waldock Farm. Um, we are uh, just outside of uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul, 25 minutes north in Minnesota. We farm on very fine sand. So we have a lot of practices that we use for very fine sand, um, more mechanical um, based because of that aspect. Um, so I'm the general manager at Waldock Farm where we have a garden center, you pick produce farm, uh, educational barnyard. So we do the uh, agritourism with uh, sunflowers and pumpkin patch and corn maize. Um, and I am also the treasurer of NAFMA, which is agritourism or International Agritourism Association. So uh, yeah, thanks for having me on the panel and hopefully we learned something. Great, thank you, Doug. Next we have Brian Campbell. Good afternoon, I'm Brian Campbell, Brian Campbell Farms. I graduated from Penn State in 1990. I uh, started a roadside stand when I was about 14. I still have that going today, but I 
greatly expanded uh, pumpkin, broccoli, and sweet corn acreage. And market, like I said, about 400 acres, and it's primarily wholesale. Great, thank you, Brian. And then Ken Arujo. Um, yes, my name's Ken Arujo. Um, we're in, located in southeastern Massachusetts, um, just east of Providence, Rhode Island, in a town called Dighton. We have a uh, retail garden center. Um, we do 50 acres of pumpkins and ornamentals for the fall. And that's how we do it as a, both as a wholesale and retail crop. Uh, we've been doing it since the 90s, um, early 90s, when we got out of vegetable production to go to more retail. And uh, it keeps getting bigger and bigger each year. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ken. All right, so you've been introduced to our panelists. Uh, a few comments that we want to make uh, as reminders to you all before we start the conversation today. Um, the statements made by our grower panel reflect their specific experience in their region of the country and in their markets. Um, so it doesn't reflect the views of Harris Seeds or Harris Moran, and please don't take it as direct advice, but maybe um, a, more of a learning experience for you to take some things away from what's been successful for them at their operation. This especially applies to um, topics of chemical application, so make sure that you are um, licensed to use any chemicals and that you follow all label instructions on any chemicals that you choose to use at your operation. Um, if our panelists recommend a chemical, it may be permitted in their state and maybe have some more restrictions in yours. So um, please be sure to do your research before you use any specific products. And um, apart from that, if you need any additional advice on pumpkin growing practices specific to your region, um, we recommend that you please work with your local extension office and those folks will be the most qualified to help you um, find solutions for problems that affect your specific area. So with that, we will switch gears into our panel discussion. Um, I will be stopping the screen share and you will be able to um, see all of the panelists on your screen. So if currently you only see my face, you have um, the Zoom set up as speaker view. You can change your view in the um, upper right corner to be gallery view, and then you'll be able to see all of the panelists at the same time. All right, and with that, we will get started with some questions. So um, we have the questions organized uh, into specific topics, and we'll be kind of bouncing around to the different panelists to each give some perspectives um, from their own operations. So we'll plan to start with some questions about fertilizing and spacing and seed starting. So um, to start, I will call on Jeremy. Can you please speak, Jeremy, to um, whether you start pumpkin transplants or if you direct sow into the field and what sort of fertilizer program you use? So we do all direct seeding. Um, we usually start uh, with some of the longer day pumpkins, May 15th, and then we end seeding about June 15th, June 20th. Um, as far as fertilizing, we do soil testing to find out where we're at. And then um, we do a pre-plant of uh, urea and ammonium sulfate. We have, we have pretty salty ground out here typically. And so we do uh, urea and ammonium sulfate as a pre-plant. Um, and then we'll come back in and use liquid uh, for phosphorus and potassium and additional nitrogen uh, as they come up. Um, we also put down a pre-plant with the seed as we're planting that is uh, it's a micro 500. It's a bunch of micronutrients and uh, um, also has some phosphorus and uh, potassium in it. So that's pretty much what we do. And if we have any problems, if fields aren't looking right, then they'll do tissue samples. But for the most part, we just go off our soil sample for pumpkins. Great, thank you. All right, um, Doug, can you speak to the fertilizer program on your farm? Do you use transplants or do you direct sow? We direct sow um, and we plant six feet apart and kind of overseed and go through when we um, hand, we hand Oh, and so we pull the uh, the the uh, extra ones that come out that come out, and we so we do a a a pre 
free field broadcast of potash and uh, ammonium um, self, sulfur magnum um, that, and then come through and side applicate with our single row cultivator two times with kind of a generic 1717 and then end it with a urea to try to get the fertilizer there at the at the end when the, the nitrogen there at the end when the pumpkin needs it at that time. Okay, great, thank you. You said that you um, direct sow at a six foot spacing and then what do you aim for for your final spacing to be done? Oh, so at we direct six, throw six feet apart and then we seed in, in row. But you know, every seeder picks up more seeds. So ideally it would be um, uh, two, two feet in row spacing. Um, so then we pull out the extras to try to give the one plant the, uh, the leg up rather than having two plants grow and have smaller pumpkins. Definitely. Okay, thank you. All right, Brian and Ken, do you have anything you'd like to add about your fertilizer program? I uh, mimic pretty much what the other growers uh, do. So, you know, soil tests are the primary thing that you want to look at. Uh, we actually use um, our corn planter. It's a vacuum planter and we're on 30 inch rows. So I block every other one off and we're planting on a five foot. And then we base our spacing on whether they're field trips or jumbo pumpkins or, or whatnot. So but very similar to what the other guys have mentioned. Okay, great. Brian, where do you have your soil testing done? Do you send it to your local extension office? Sure. So once again, I graduated from Penn State and they have a pretty good soils lab, which are part of our local extension. So we, we send it there, but there's quite a few soil labs out there and uh, you know, people should be feel comfortable to, to send any, any lab that they'd like. Great, thank you. Ken, would you like to add anything? Um, Pretty much what they said we do, but uh, we do a, little, a few different things in our fertilizer program. Um, basically in the fall, we do our fall, we do our soil analysis for the following spring in the fields. And if it needs, we add our potash in the fall and then put our cover crop. And in the spring, what we do is we work with Caravale and we use an encapsulated nitrogen program. So we basically put down all our nutrients at planting. And, uh, if we got heavy leaching or whatever like this past year, we do soil and a tissue sample just before running to supplement any nutrients. That's what we do. Okay, great, thank you. Do any of you use any foliar fertilizers at this time? We do if we did last year because of we had so much rain and we lost a lot of nutrients, we did foliar. Okay. But you use it kind of on an as needed basis rather than part of your full program. Exactly, it's usually when there's a problem. Okay, thank you. We run foliar with our uh, fungicide just because we're already going over the field and it doesn't cost much to throw foliar on. So we put some of that micro 500 in with our fungicide yeah. just to kind of give the plant a uh, immunity boost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly to have healthy, um, well-fertilized plants will help them fend off a lot of diseases. So that's a good way to approach that. All right, we talked a little bit about spacing. A couple of you have given some comments about the spacing that you use. Um, have you seen on your farm that spacing um, in particular has affected the end crop of pumpkins that you, you've harvested? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh... You know, the field trip variety from Harris Moran is the one you can, we, we can plant that at two foot on a six foot row. But when you start going, Kratos is our mainstay and that's real happy anywhere from 38 to 48 inches on a six foot row where that's very happy. So, you know, we do accordingly. We have a vacuum planner also and we adjust the spacing. Okay, great. Thank you, Ken. Have any of the other panelists, have you ever played around with spacing and, and seen any different results? We, we do a lot of different stuff. Um, we're on 40 inch rows and uh, we used to plant every row and then space them out within the row. And then if you have to hand hoe them, you've got four rows to hoe instead of two rows. So we go every other row. Um, we actually do two rows under the tractor and then leave two blank. And um, we, we always plant thicker than what uh, I think most people do and we're trying to get out of that habit just because of uh, 
the cost of seed. But uh, but we just go, you know, finding ones that have big pumpkins, got to space them out more. We try to keep them in like the 2,500 seeds per acre area. And then uh, you're, uh, we do a lot of cannonball for the uh, pie pumpkin market. Um, and we do all four rows on 40s with those two feet apart. So we get a, about, what, 13,000 stand per field. So it's really just all about following the variety and, and going from there. Um, but yeah, the big ones space them out a lot and the little ones, you can usually cram them together a little closer. Great, thank you, Jeremy. James, would you like to add anything um, regarding spacing and different varieties? Sure, so, I mean, I, I, I'm not gonna deviate from the recommendations, but um, there, there's a lot of really interesting literature on the subject of spacing within pumpkins and, and what happens if we go at these really high densities to things like yield, pumpkin size, and, and just the tonnage that's coming out of the field, just the pure you know, mass that we're, we're generating in the field. And there, there was a really interesting paper in, in the 90s from Cornell and, and several other papers on, but looking at vining pumpkins and semi-bush pumpkins. And they found that you, you can increase the density and you get more pumpkins, but you get smaller pumpkins. They're, they're a little bit smaller. But they, the really interesting conclusion from their paper was you can get away with higher densities, particularly if you, and, and generate, you know, higher numbers of pumpkins, if you keep the spacing more, so it, the spacing, excuse me, the plants are much more evenly distributed through the field. So you have, uh, that was mentioned here, six foot spacing at 48 inches. That's, that's much more of, a, more of a square shape around the plot. So it's equally, the space is equal around the plant versus something like a, a five foot beds on two foot spacing. It's much more rectangular. So in the study, they found they could get away with, you know, your, your tonnage coming out of the field and the effect of, you know, that plant to plant competition goes way down if you can try to make them as equally distributed as possible. So if I were a grower, I was feeling adventurous and you know wanted to deviate from the recommendations, I, I would play with the spacing, but make sure I try to keep it as equidistant as possible. Uh, one other quick point. So last year, Harris Seed did a, a somewhat an informal observational trial in, in Virginia, their field days. And um, they, they played with the spacing with Kratos, um, a, a, a larger binning pumpkin. Um, I think they went down to like a one foot spacing. I can't remember what the bed, what the beds were distributed. Maybe it was five foot beds or 48 beds or 48 inch beds. Um, but walking through the field and looking at the numbers, there was a very obvious yield bump in the lower, you know, the higher density plots versus the low density plots. And the size differences between the pumpkins were very subtle. I mean, I, I was quite surprised. I came in there with a high expectation. We'd see some really small Kratos uh, pumpkins, but that was not the case. They were, it was very subtle. So again, if you're feeling, if, if it's not broken, don't fix it, of course. But if you're feeling like you'd like to play with it, I think there's some, I, I think there's a lot of support for, for trying, you know, higher densities under your operations. So, yeah. Great. Thank you, James. All right. So the next topic that we'll lean into is crop rotation. So Brian, I'll have you speak first. Um, how important is crop rotation on your farm? Um, what is your preferred rotation sequence? And do you feel that you need to rotate between different varieties? Sure, so crop rotation is extremely important. Uh, one of the primary diseases that's out there is Phytophthora. And uh, there really isn't much chemical control for that. So rotational uh, cropping is, is important for that disease in itself. Um, we rotate with some agronomic crops, soybeans and uh, field corn. We're also primarily no-till. Uh, so we're cover cropping in addition to uh, the agronomic crops. So we'll use field corn and soybeans. And I usually like to end up with soybeans so I can get a, a nice fry cover crop into that to go into that with pumpkins the following year. Um, so yeah, you know, primarily a four year rotation would be best uh if anybody has experienced phytophthora you'll understand why uh stronger rotations are necessary uh once you get phytophthora it's it's not easy to go back into that field you tend to see it you know for for life so to speak and you really have to get out of that ground but i don't want to get talking about diseases at this point so crop rotation extremely important great thank you brian and yes with phytophthora there's there's very limited 
um, natural resistance in pumpkins for Phytophthora right now. Hopefully we can ask James to work on that, um, or he is working on that, but um, to be able to implement other tools like rotation can make a huge difference in that way. All I, right. Kristen, I could give a Go quick ahead, comment James. on, so Phytophthora resistance breeding, I, I think the industry is a long ways off. I mean, I think it's, it's going to be something we've been working, it's been, people have been working on it for a very, very long time. There's a lot of interesting research coming out of Cornell and, and the University of Florida right now, um, but we're a ways off from that. It, it's certainly something we spend a lot of time thinking about and talking about, um, and there, like I said, there's some interesting opportunities, but I, I would explore cultural management in, until we can really develop resistant varieties. I, I've, we've had a bad experience with Phytophthora in the past. Um, and I'm going to share with everyone if they want to, you know, my, our experience and what we've done. We've gone through we'd, all the fields that had problems. We rotated out. We did deep zone tillage. And we either put silage corn and or sorghum sudan grass on it and plowed or disked it into the soil and built up the organic matter. It's not a silver bullet, but it's helped immensely as Great. far as living with Phytophthora and then get rotating out. Do it one year with pumpkins and get out. Sure, thank you, Ken. Yes, it's definitely not something that there's a, a cure for, but if we can figure out ways to manage it the best as possible, it'll, it'll pay off for sure. Um, all right, can anyone speak to on their farms, have you felt a need to rotate between different varieties from year to year in the same space? I don't have any thoughts on that. I, I do. Um, on the Harris varieties, the one that is can be in land the most that we've experienced mm -hmm. constantly is field trip. Um, Kratos wants to be in a field for no more than two years and then be rotated out for a couple of years. Um, unfortunately, in Massachusetts, we're limited to space. We, we let 10 acres. We plant 50 acres, but we actually have about 65 acres of land dedicated to pumpkins, and we'll let 15 acres go in either silage or a sedan grass, and then we turn it into the turn it into the soil in the ball. And that seems to be, you know, you can go back after a year and go back with Kratos and you'll be okay. Our biggest disease issue here is Fusarium fruit rot more than Phytophthora now. Okay. Yeah, thank you for those comments, Ken. So definitely plan your rotations around your disease pressures, but also keep in mind fertility, like Brian mentioned, um, to finish with something um, that will set your pumpkins up for having a really good um, seed bed with high nutrition is a good place to start. Okay, um, the next set of questions that we'll go into is pollination and fruit set. Um, Jeremy, can you speak at all about um, fruit set on your farm, have you seen anything in particular that impacts how um, strongly of a fruit set you get from year to year? Um, the thing that affects us up here is the heat. Um, it seems like if you get too many, too hot of days with too hot of nights, we don't seem to set pumpkins that well. Um, we experienced it last year. Our pumpkins didn't start setting until I want to say it was late July or August before we started seeing fruit on them. Like we were starting to get nervous if we're going to have any pumpkins. Um, we do bring bees in. Um, we don't have to pay for any bees because we have some good relationships out there where they just want to, they, they take advantage of the alfalfa fields that are local to us. And then the amount of squash that we have. Um, and they're just kind of staging their bees after they bring them up after almonds in California and drop them off there and they just, they're close to, to where these people live. And so we bring up, uh, we have about two hives per acre, I think is what they drop off, maybe even a little more. Um, so, I mean, that's the biggest thing for us is that, uh, that heat thing on the, the fruit set. So it doesn't matter how Thank many you, bees you have. Yeah. Can you give any tips for growers if they feel um, a little nervous, like you said, seeing their crop and, and they're not sure that they're getting good set? Do you have any tips for, for them or things to watch for or what your experience has been in those seasons where the set wasn't that strong at the outright? Um, 
my advice on that's not very good. <laughs> my, my advice on pumpkins is just don't look at them for a while. <laughs> so yeah, um, they're kind don't of get like, too nervous. On, on our farm, the pumpkins are kind of the plant it and forget it crop because they're so easy to grow um, for us up here. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, just, just years, don't get too though, nervous too soon, you know? Yeah, you, you do get a crop off of them. You just have to be patient, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. Last year was a weird year up here, so yeah. But. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll call on Doug next. Can you speak a little bit more about um, pollination and, and how you manage the honeybee hives on your farm? Yeah. So when I first came back to the farm, like 15 years ago, we had just about five, five uh, um, um, beehives, but we grew about 15 acres of pumpkins at that time. So <clears throat> we increased the next year to 17 hives. And it's amazing how much each bloom then developed a good fruit. So it was clearly that we were deficient on pollination on the farm. So our fruits had increased dramatically, which then like allowed us to grow net less pumpkins the following year or sell more pumpkins at the market. Um, and we, we had increased about you know one hive to one acre, um, but since then we've uh, increased to more hives than we needed per acre, um, but still seeing that good set. Kind of the hard part for us sometimes with the honeybees, if we get uh, rain for too long during the day, that can affect our set. So um, uh, bumblebee, we don't have any, we don't bring bumblebees in, but we do try to have parts of our farm that we don't disturb as much to hopefully get some native, some native bees flying, because that's a benefit to the bumblebees is they fly on some of the less ideal days when the honeybees decide not to fly. So we can have less set of pumpkins if we get a, a week of rain or something, or, you know, you miss those blooms because, you know, they only bloom for a day. If it's a rainy day, you miss those sets. So um, we do have, we do have honeybees and, and they, they do, you know, it affected all the cucurbits really well. Um, but still bumblebees do have, have their, their place. If it's uh if you're, if you have a wetter climate when the pumpkins are blooming. Great, thank you. Yes, that's good to know that it's um, good to have a diversity of, of native pollinators and some hives on your farm to really help boost that, that fruit set in all sorts of climates. There's some things we can't control, but um, we can help encourage, I suppose, right? Um, yeah, and I've, I've visited farms that have bees come in and if it's not a tentative beekeeper, they might say you have so many hives, but a couple of the hives could be dead. So that's really one reason why we, take it on ourselves because you do need active hives to pollinate. So, so yeah. Definitely. Doug, do you have any tips for growers who uh, might be interested in adding hives and managing themselves, um, but they've not done it before? Any places to start? Well, the best place to start is small, um, you know, but also if you don't start, like you need, you need a couple hives, but we're talking about acres, right? So you need at least 10, 10 hives if you have, um, if you have 10, 10, 10 acres. Um, so the, there's always uh, local um, uh, hobby groups, really the hobby beekeepers or even some professional beekeepers go to that place. So there's a Minnesota hobby beekeepers, which has a lot of good information. So stuff like that would be a good way to start, but at least start with two, because you got to compare, right? Mm -hmm. We know that from farming. Right, all right, thank you, Doug. Do any of the other panelists have any comments to add about fruit set and pollination? I, I can comment a little bit. Um, so the rule of thumb is one hive per acre. Um, commercially to rent a hive here in Pennsylvania, it's about $135 per hive. Um, we've done, have been participants in some uh, pollinator research, which has come a long way since the colony collapse disorder that honeybees have been getting. Uh, Penn State's got a, a huge uh, interest in uh, doing research in that. So some entomologists have been doing research on this farm for 10 years and working with native pollinators. So unfortunately, no disrespect for the honeybee keepers, but if you're looking at native pollinators compared to uh, honeybees, Honeybees tend to be very lazy 
Uh, they're not out there in the cloudy, rainy weather. Comes to native pollinators, bumblebees, just phenomenal difference between the, those and honeybees. So just some uh, getting out in the fields, looking at some flowers that may be blooming and getting an idea for what native pollinators are out there has allowed me to back off on some of the quantities of honeybees we've had on certain farms. Mm. Um, we've also started planting a lot of pollinator habitats, uh, which we think are making, making an impact. And each person also that's, that's spraying their bees want to be cautious of what time they're spraying. And one of the problems is people getting out there and spraying and they're killing all their native uh, pollinators that are out there, which really can deplete, you know, the number of pollinators are there. So there's a tremendous amount of information out there. Native pollinators, in my opinion, is, is one of the ways uh, to best get the pollination done, but there's an awful lot of research out there and I'd encourage everybody to, uh, to look at that. And uh, there's no question without insects, uh, you're not gonna get a pumpkin crop. You've, you've gotta have those insects out there, whether honeybees or native pollinators. Great, thank you, Brian. All right, a question that I will pass over to James. We have some often questions from growers if they need to be concerned about cross-pollination between pumpkin varieties in their pumpkin fields. Can you speak to that? Sure, so, I mean, from a breeding standpoint, that's, that's exactly what we do. We, we take interesting parents and we cross them and create populations from those to, to look for new innovative pumpkins. Um, from a growing standpoint, it, I mean, it shouldn't be a, a concern because what you're not going to be salvaging, you're not going to be harvesting seed from these and planting those out. That's where it would affect. So the subsequent generation would be affected by the parentage, but, but by the pollination at service itself, I mean, that's just beneficial. The pollen's going to lead to a fruit and you're going to get, you're going to get your pumpkin. So there, there should be no effect of the pollination um, on the pumpkins. Great. Thank you. So yeah, the difference there, if you're a sweet corn grower, you know you have to be mindful about isolating different types. Um, when it comes to pump, pumpkins and squash, you don't have to worry about it as long as you're harvesting those fruit and selling those. Um, but certainly, um, like James says, when they're doing their, their breeding populations and crosses, that's where they can see some really interesting things. So um, we'll leave that to them to, to sort out all of those cool things and bring them to us. All right, uh, the next topic that we will cover is weed management. Uh, the first question is, do you grow pumpkins on plastic mulch or bare soil and why? Uh, Ken, can you speak to what you do on your farm? Do you use bare soil or plastic mulch? We use bare, bare soil and then we, this year we're gonna do some on a burn down with some rye, uh, completely no till. Cause we've been basically minimum tillage and what we do, how we've been doing it is we, we prep, prep the land, uh, broadcast our fertilizer according to the recommendations and incorporate it. We plant and then we band spray our herbicide right over the row. We do an 18 inch uh, band over the row and then we do cultivation two to three times through the crop. That's what we're doing, have been doing and we're trying to do some, uh, this year, we're going to trial five acres, um, which we had on sorghum sedan grass, which we disked in in the fall. We seeded rye on top of it. This is a field that's been notorious for fusarium fruit rot, and it's an experiment because um, sedan grass gives off prussic acid when it's decomposing, and it, it does kill fusarium. It like, works like the mm -hmm. old vape ham. It's a fumigant. So we'll try on trialing five acres, doing it this way, and then burn the rye down with Roundup and spray strategy as we plant the pumpkins and see what happens. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I guess I'll ask Brian a similar question. You do a lot of no-till on your farm as well. Can you speak to any um, weed management practices that have worked best for you in conjunction with that no-till practice? Sure. So I said before, I'm primarily, we're hundred percent no-till. We, whether it's into field corn, we typically try to put it into a rye uh, mm -hmm. crop or crop. Occasionally I pick up new ground and I need the ground. So we'll, we'll go into field corn or soybeans, uh, no-till. Um, 
it can take a couple of years until you really, you know, understand what needs to be done to, to grow a, a decent crop. Weed control can be an issue. Some of the bigger problems tend to be if you have a very thick cover crop, sometimes getting that seed into the ground and having good soil to seed contact can be difficult also. But really the, you know, at time of harvest, that clean pumpkin uh, really makes a difference compared to bare soil. So I'd encourage everybody to, to really try it and just don't give up on the first year. You just keep working on it. So there's plenty of, you know, information out there to try to do it. But as far as weed management, um, you know, getting, getting a burn down on it. So whether it's Roundup, Ramoxone, um, there's even a two, some 2,4-D products. If you want to go on, once again, I, I'm not necessarily making recommendations, but some opportunities that work. There's some 2,4-D products uh, that you might use. There's mare's tail out there that's Roundup resistant. So you want to be concerned about that. So four weeks prior to planting, some 2,4-D products work on that also. So we get that burned down and then we're coming back with a strategy, a command and uh, dual Sandia, just naming some chemicals out there that are all worth worthwhile. Um, and you, there is some escape herbicides to use. Sandia is one of them and some grass herbicides. So really the cleanliness of the, the crop on, on no-till and um, the weed management, you know, covering the ground with, with a nice cover crop is also help prevent the seeds from growing also. So uh, don't give up on the first year, keep trying. Definitely, thanks, Brian. Can you also speak to what type of equipment you use to plant your pumpkin seeds within um, your cover crop to get that good soil contact that you mentioned? Sure, so um, they're conservation tillage um, corn planters uh, similar to what you'd use for field corn. And um, we use a 12 row actually, and there's, there's plenty of weight to get penetration and their pneumatic downforce, summer spring downforce, but you, you really wanna get a lot of pressure uh, to penetrate the, the weeds. Uh, we found that if you've got row cleaners and your rye is still somewhat green, it, it can wrap up around the, the row cleaners. So we found to lift the row cleaners up and just go through the ground with your seed openers and get them as, as deep as you need to to get down in there an inch to two inches. Um, and, and we've been successful with that. Okay, thank you. Have you found um, that different depths make a difference for any of your different pumpkins versus squash versus different varieties? Or you tend to plant a, a consistent depth for everything? Yeah, so I used, I used to think uh, getting them in the ground an inch and uh, get them up and going as quick as possible. But several years that I've done that, we found birds coming in and they see that blue or green coating uh, on the cotyledons and they're grabbing a hold of it and pulling it out. And we've lost quite a few for that purpose. So we actually are preferring to go down in about two inches so that the the root system gets a little establishment there. And if the seed coat is showing, they can't pull the whole seed out at that point. So that's, so we've been preferring that inch and a half to two inches most recently. Okay, thank you. Another thing that it just, it takes experimenting and, and observation in your field to know what works best for your space. Sure. Okay, um, Doug, I'll pass it over to you next. Would you please speak to how you grow if it's on bare soil or plastic mulch and what kind of weed control methods you, you use? Yeah, so like I mentioned before, I'm on fine sand. Um, so we, uh, and we, we rotate between other um, crops. Uh, we, we do a lot of mechanical weeding. So um, it is, uh, um, we don't do any, we do a cover crop that we work and break down well before we get into the field and then we cultivate them four, three times um, after they're up but we did start it just a couple of years ago doing the pre-emergent uh, three days after we plant with some of the chemicals listed before with with the roundup in there just in case some something came up we don't have the time or the equipment to do it right away so we uh, we stay great about three days before it comes up we use that strategy or dual magnum or or that sort of thing and that, that's by, by the way that we don't have to do our first round of hoeing, but we do um, once we start uh, 
and with the fine sand, we like to put the fertilizer down often um, because we will have leaching problems if, uh, if we try to put it all on right away. Um, I should look into some of the time release um, fertilizers mentioned earlier. Um, so we side grass and side cultivate um, once, the, once or if the chemical doesn't work or once it starts to wear off um, and uh, do our thinning. Then and we do have a crew. Crew, if it ha if we have to, we go through and hand hole if uh, if the the chemicals didn't didn't uh, didn't do their job that year because it really seems like they need rain to activate. So if we're having that dry year and not getting rain every six to seven days to re reactivate it, it, it doesn't do what you think it is. Just like every practice, you kind of have to give it a while to learn learn how it does affect your farm and if it's the right choice. So, so yeah, we, we seed, we do a, a spray for a pre-emergent, and depending on how it goes, we cultivate, side applicate, and hold. Okay, thank you. Yeah, a good reminder as well to um, be really mindful of what products you're using and what their mode of action is so that you can be watchful of why it may or may not be as effective in that specific season um, or in that area of your farm, um, for example. So thank you, Doug. All right, we'll move on to the next topic of disease management and I'll call in James first um, to speak briefly about how important it is to look for varieties that have disease resistance. I'd say, uh, Dan, nearly a, a quarter, almost a half of my time is spent focusing, well, maybe not quite that much. Spend a, I spend an enormous amount of time and the company spends a lot of resources. We have pathologists on site, we have geneticists on site that are their sole purpose is to identify sources of resistance and then working with the breeders integrate that resistance through conventional breeding into um, commercial varieties. So um, it's massively important. And, and fortunately in pumpkin, and I, I think we're lucky in this in the sense that we can take advantage of not just cucurbita pipo, which is the species of pumpkin, but we can look at cousins, cucurbita cousins, if you will, and integrate those resistances into, into commercial varieties. So for example, the the powdery mildew resistance, when you have powdery mildew resistant pumpkins, that, that didn't originate in cucurbita people. That came from a cousin of cucurbita people um, that was, and this was decades ago. So that one resistance gene that's responsible for most of that resistance, again, didn't come from cucurbita people. Um, so, in, and I, I mentioned this in regards to Phytophthora as well, that the disease resistance breeding is, is largely a it's a commercial, so commercial companies are working very hard on this, but it's, a, it's often a collaboration with universities. I mentioned the University of Phy, uh, Florida for Phytophthora resistance. Um, powdery mildew is another one we're, we're working on, virus resistances. Different universities are, have programs that are focused on this. So we, we contact these researchers and we try to do what we can to collaborate, not just with them, but also with the USDA, I, sh I should mention as well. Some really great research comes out of the USDA. And extensionists are, are a big part of, uh, university extensionists are a huge part of uh, making sure that information, you know, bleeds down to the, to the growers. Great, thank you, James. All right, so we'll kick off some of the disease management questions with Jeremy. Um, Jeremy, can you talk about some of the primary pumpkin diseases that you deal with, um, your current fungicide program, or maybe some varieties that you have found that hold up the best on your farm to different diseases? Oh, you're muted, Jeremy. You're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> um, so biggest thing in our area is powder, powdery mildew, um, which I'm sure everyone's got that problem. Um, and the powdery mildew resistant pumpkin or squash is the best thing that's ever been made. Um, so we don't plant anything that doesn't have powdery mildew resistance. If we can, there are some specialty pumpkins um, don't have it that we still need but you can definitely tell the difference um we've dealt with black rot up here um we have a lot of mosaic virus here um mosaic virus can be really cool in pumpkins if you're retailing them but it can be detrimental in wholesale because they want perfect pumpkins and they don't want green flecks all over them and so you have to find something that masks that or uh is resistant um like those uh that little is it the little pixie pumpkin they were showing the precocious yellow uh, gene we look for those um 
even in our yellow squash uh, that we grow, we look for that precocious gene. Um, and then on the mosaic virus, they've done tons of research up here on it because it's so bad in Utah. And hosts are like alfalfa, which we have a bunch of, and um, clover. And so the aphids will house on that and then they can move 20 miles overnight. So it doesn't matter if you don't have alfalfa, if someone down the road 20 miles has it and it's infected and they have aphids, you're going to get it. So, and then we, we've also had alternaria leaf spot and um, fusarium. Um, but I think a lot of disease goes back to just having a healthy plant. You're going to get it. Um, and even if the plant's resistant, you, if you get it bad enough, you're still going to show symptoms. And so if you have a healthy plant going into the season, you know, you start off with a starter fertilizer or you've done everything you can to ensure it's super healthy. It's going to fight the disease more than any other thing out there. Um, we do do a, uh, a preventative application of Bravo. Um, and then we also, I think it's rid of gold we're using. Um, and I saw a question on here that's asked how we spray over the top of pumpkin vines that have already ran. Um, we have a local co-op that has, you know, which I'm sure everyone has, that has big sprayers with 150 foot booms on them. And we'll just let them crush a pathway. And there's some areas where we can still do airplane. Um, on one of the new farms we're running, we can start using a, an airplane to spray. But uh, we also like to spray at night to avoid any contact with pollinators, whether it's supposed to hurt them or not. We just don't want to take that risk. So that's pretty much what we're doing. Um, the crop rotation is good. If you get a disease in there, you might want to start thinking about moving. Um, we've tried to we had a field that had alternaria one year and we came back three years later and we still showed alternaria even with uh, the Bravo application and uh, good plants. Um, we still made a crop, but you could tell all season long that they were sick. So crop rotation is good. And yeah, like I said, health of plants. So that's our approach. Great, thank you, Jeremy. I'll call out Brian next, if you would speak to your disease management program. Um, at the scope of your farm, um, some of the chemicals that you found have been really helpful. And uh, maybe if you know of any products that would be good for organic growers or growers that don't have licenses, um, if you could suggest any of those as well, if you're familiar with them. Sure. Um, so once again, a, a healthy plant and staying ahead of a preventive uh, maintenance program is uh, much better than waiting till you're, you know, seeing powdery mildew across the field and it's, you know, pretty extensive. Um, powdery mildew is probably one of the, you know, most prevalent uh, diseases that are out there. Even if you've got powdery mildew resistant plants, you're still going to see some powdery mildew in there. So and it seems that chemicals build resistance to those fairly quick. Um, the Mid-Atlantic Vegetable Guide, which Rutgers, Cornell, Penn State, all uh, are participants in, those are some very good commercial vegetable guides, even for a, you know, maybe you're not a commercial grower, there's some still good information in those. Um, some of the powdery mildew resistant, or I'm sorry, powdery mildew chemicals, uh, Vivando, Quintec, uh, come to mind. Uh, Quintex starting to get a little resistant to it already. Um, there's a couple more, it's not coming to my mind, but like I said, they are in those vegetable guides. Um, we're also utilizing uh, Bravo on a regular basis and obviously spraying in the evening when the pollinators are, on, are not out there is, is best also. But, um, you know, trying to stay ahead of, ahead of those and I once again go to those guides they're they're very helpful and it's some of the latest information they update them every year and that's that's really where your best information is going to come from but stay on top of powdery mildew. Great thank you Brian for those recommendations and those guides sound very helpful so that'll be good for growers in that area to check those out. All right, on um, a similar topic, we'll, we'll kind of transition into pest management. 
um, in terms of different insect pests. And I'll ask Ken if you would speak to some things that you've done to um, manage insect pests in your pumpkin crops. Uh, yes, uh, we've been kind of fortunate. We try to don't try to plant our first pumpkins. In Massachusetts, we have a flight or we have a, a, they emerge from the soil cucumber beetle. That's our biggest problem. And they tend to come out of the soil somewhere between the third and fourth week of May. And they subside from around the first week of June till the end of June. Then, they, then you'll get your second generation. We've been planting in between these, well, we usually start around the 7th of June to the round when we end up, end up around the 24th of June. And in the last 10 years, I've only sprayed twice for cucumber beetle with last year being the issue because it was so wet and so humid. But uh, we've been fortunate that we haven't had to do any insect spraying other than maybe once in a while if you do some squash bug later in the season. But with rotation, that the squash bug is not such an issue. It's kind of, you know, that's what we've been doing and we've been pretty lucky. I don't know if anyone else has had the uh, experience that or noticed that by going, trying to plant in between cycles. Yeah, that's a good recommendation. Just the same as with rotating and, and being very aware of what's going on in your field, scouting regularly for diseases and pests, and then um, becoming familiar with those rotations in your area. You can um, hopefully avoid having to apply too many applications. Like you said, Ken, that's great that you've been able to um, minimize the applications needed by watching those uh, population cycles. Do any of the other panelists want to chime in on anything regarding um, insect management? I just comment um, far more uh, amount of cloprid if you're not an organic grower. Um, I don't really see a reason out there that you, you shouldn't be using those. That's really going to take care of your you know, some of the cucumber beetles and uh, right, right off the bat when they get through the ground. So that, that's kind of a no brainer to, to be purchased a seed with, with that application on. Great, thank you, Brian. Yeah, the far more treatment is available on a lot of pumpkin and squash varieties. And like Brian said, it um, will protect the seed as well as the young seedling. Um, for an extended amount of time. I think it's about three weeks. So it really does help um, that young seedling get kind of a boost and um, kind of make its way into the world without having too much insect pressure on it. So certainly something to consider. And then you don't have to handle the insecticide because it's already applied to the seed. Okay, great. Um, the the next... cucumber beetle? Yes, One thing with awesome. cucumber beetle we were taught a few years back is that they overwinter in the field. So we try, it, it's hard to pair with some of the cover crop uh, practices people are doing now, but that's what we work the field in to make sure there's not much uh, room for uh, soil or plant material above the soil. So the frost goes deeper and we've found a reduction in the cucumber beetles too, because we're, the frost is going deeper and uh, in killing that or reducing the, the population. So a, a fall, uh, a fall, a, a clean field in the fall, it leads to less of the cucumber beetles for us. Great, thank you, Doug. All right, the next set of questions in terms of pest management are um, with some of our mammal friends. So um, deer and groundhogs and other things like that. Um, can anyone speak to how you best prevent um, that damage. Um, we, we can probably anticipate some of the management methods, but um, if you have found anything creative on your farm to minimize that impact to your crop, um, please share. Um, I guess I can start. Um, we have, a, we have a, a pest control company in Eastern, Southeastern Mass that uh, goes around to all the farms in this early spring and you know it's it it costs us two hundred fifty dollars for a visit. Well, what the gentleman does or his company does is he'll scout all the fields and go around the edges, and he'll find early spring where the wood trucks, uh, groundhogs are coming out of the ground, and trap them. And then it's it's twenty five dollars for every you know uh, groundhog he traps. And uh, since we've been doing that, it sounds like a lot of money, but there's there's several 
Winter Squash Growers in our area, and we all use the same company for a service. And it's it's worth every dime. If we do, if we didn't do it, it, we'd have a big problem. And the same thing with Massachusetts. We have a nuisance permit program as far as deer. And it's done through the, the uh, fish and game. And we have to record, unfortunately, you know, if there's an extreme problem, we can, uh, you know, we have to eradicate them, unfortunately. But there's such a huge population in southeastern Massachusetts. Um, the other night, one of our neighbors, he had 27 deer in his backyard. It's, it's pretty insane here. But they, I don't know if other, how states work. Massachusetts, a few years ago, had some grants available for high fencing for some of the farms. I don't know, you know, Pennsylvania or Minnesota or any of those states have those grants available. Minnesota has those grants available. And our first deer fence we built probably 20 years ago through that program. But it mm -hmm. also taught us that it's just worth spending the money for a deer fence. So that was a seven foot five high single, single rows of high tensile wire. And now we have woven eight feet tall with two strands of high tensile above that around all the fields we grow pumpkins in. We grow 35 acres, so it's it's about a mile and a half and two are both of our farms of, of fencing. So we're kind of a smaller scale that, but it's it pays off, it, you know, people don't buy a pumpkin with one one uh, horse but, or uh, horse bite either or deer bite in it. So it, you gotta protect that, you gotta protect your crop. Great, thank you guys. Yeah, so certainly, um, become aware of what grants might be available in your area for fencing, what um, programs like the trapping program that Ken mentioned, um, the company in his area. So there's things that um, may already exist that could help. Um, and also, again, if you do end up going um, the route of a nuisance permit or something to that effect, make sure that you know what the requirements are uh, for your area and your state to make sure you're within uh, the legal compliances there. All right, thank you everyone. Um, so now we'll transition into some conversation about harvesting and merchandising. Um, we'll start with some questions regarding harvest timing and storage. Um, I'll ask Jeremy to start. If you can talk about your approach to scheduling your plantings to make sure that you have product early enough in the fall and then product to last you through uh, the end of the season. Um, yeah, so uh, especially with our wholesale market, uh, right after Labor Day is the grocery stores, they want product on their floor. So you need to ship the week before Labor Day. And you're not even thinking about pumpkins by then, but that's the way retail works is they're onto the next best thing and watermelons don't sell after Labor Day, so they're onto pumpkins. Um, so we start planning um, a a little bit early, like May 15th is when we start up here. And that will give us our orange pumpkins uh, right before Labor Day. And then, like I said earlier, we end June 15th and that'll give us our latest pumpkins. Um, and on on the harvest and handling, um, it's pumpkins are tricky, especially in the areas that have the hotter falls. Um, if you get them too early, you're gonna get soft pumpkins. If you don't get them early enough, you're gonna have green pumpkins. And every year is different, but that window there has seemed to work for us. And then one of the biggest things on pumpkins and squash, um, both, is the sooner you can get them off the field without cold temperatures on them, like below 45, um, even 40, um, the longer they're going to last. Um, we've seen it side by side in our warehouse before where we've had some that have had a light frost that just killed the vines, but the squash are still fine. They last a month less than the ones that came off two weeks before with no frost on them. And um, some things we like to clip them and let them cure, put them in rows and let them cure. Other things, you know, you can't do that with, um, cause you'll sacrifice like the handle quality and um, stuff like that. But uh, yeah, so that's kind of how we're, we're managing all of ours, so. Sorry, I was muted that time. Thank you, Jeremy. 
Um, Brian, would you please speak to what has been a good practice for your farm and um, keeping your wholesale customers supplied and at the time that they'd like, as well as having items on your roadside stand throughout the season? Sure. So once again, I'm primarily wholesale and the markets, as Jeremy, Jeremy mentioned, they, they want pumpkins on their shelves uh, Labor Day. So we're as soon as we see those temps get warm in the beginning of May, we're going to be getting some acreage out there. Um, there was one year that there was an opportunity and I missed that. And then the rain came and I never ended up getting any. I missed that first opportunity. So when I see warm temperatures, I'm, I'm always out there getting, getting something in, even if it's May 1st, uh, so I can capture that Labor Day. And then we're going all the way through June 15th. So the typically on the large chain stores, the majority of pumpkins are sold the last two weeks of October. So we need a, a quality pumpkin at that point. And for us, the large quantity, we don't have storage for anything. So you wanna see a, a nice fresh green stem on there. So we're looking for pumpkins that are still green, you know, maybe the beginning of October but are gonna ripen up by that October 15th. And that's given us our best quality. Uh, there are times that we get frost and you know the pumpkins are laying out there all opened up, but we're, we're planning our, our timings out there that we're planting up till the middle of June. Um, as far as retail, um, we're pretty much okay with you know everything getting ready in September and, and harvesting them, getting them out to the stand. But uh, from a whole, wholesale perspective, I, I think you're looking for opportunities there right at Labor Day and, and carrying it through October. Great, thank you. Ken, can you speak to your markets, the um, most effective ways you found to have um, to store the pumpkins and make sure that they are of good quality late into the season? Again, a lot of what Brian said is what we do. Our timing's a little different. We don't start seeding till, like I said, the 7th of June and ending up around the 21st to the 24th of June. Um, again, our market, my wholesale customers, again, is we start dabbling a little bit at Labor Day, but my most of my wholesale business is from the 15th of September to around the 21st of October. So that's why we we push it out another week or so more than they're doing as far as planting. And again, it's on our fungicide program. What we do, we start we start spraying around usually the third week of August, uh, third week of July, first week of August, and we'll we'll continue fungicide program on the later varieties up until about a week before we harvest. So we're still we're still putting fungicide down second week of October that seems to help. I mean, if you stay on top of the downy and the powdery at that time of the year and you have not a lot of rain, uh, you'll have a nice green Kratos that you can clip and it will, it will, as long as you don't have frost, as they say, if they're going to, when they're talking frost, we harvest everything, put it in the storage building. But, uh, and we'll, we always make sure we spray a fungicide two to three days before we harvest. And on the retail, what we do is uh, as fast as we can pick them, we put them out because we go through about 30 to 40 bins a weekend. And we always, when we go into a new field, that's what we pick for our own retail. Then we come back and the rest goes out wholesale. Okay. How many passes do you typically take across the field? Um, there's times we can do everything in one. Uh, one pass later in the season, uh, early in the season, it's sometimes it's twice and sometimes you'll go back a third time, depending, you know, how, how much demand there is at that point that determines sure. it. Because I mean, at the very beginning, you're not going to clip 100%. Right. Okay, thank you. Ken, can you also speak to what sort of storage space you have? Um, like you mentioned, in some cases, if a frost is coming, you pick everything you've got and store it. Can you speak to what sort of space you use for your storage? Well, we used to store a lot of butternut squash. Uh, that was our main focus back in the 80s and the 90s. And we got a build and it's, it's uh, 64 by 200. And it's uh, 20 feet up to the, up to the, the trusses and 
you know, we, we can stack the bins in there and we got cir circulating air fans and we try to keep, you know, the air movement and we try to, uh, don't let it get any cooler than 55 degrees at night. Uh, and during the day, we just keep the doors open and, you know, just keep the air moving. Okay. And we've had pretty good luck, especially yeah. with the newer varieties. Field Trip and Kratos, if you pick them and the stem is firm at that point and they're dry, they'll last three weeks before you have to, before they start shrinking on you. Okay, thank you. Would anyone else like to add any comments about um, pumpkin storage? Okay. Um, so we'll move on to the next topic of merchandising and we'll start with wholesale. Mm. Um, so these questions mm. would be um, for Jeremy, Ken and Brian. Um, if you are a grower who's looking to start wholesaling, do you have any advice for those growers um, and any advice on how you find new wholesale customers? Maybe we'll start with Brian. Sure. So I, I'm going to go back to the 90s when I first got started and I wasn't raising any pumpkins. So I went down to the local Walmart, uh, which there wasn't any super centers at the time. And I asked them, you know, where they got their pumpkins from and they didn't have any idea who the buyer was or anything. So I continued to research and just found out, you know, some contacts and made some phone calls. So I was persistent in, in finding out. And then I you know, had to, you have to sell yourself a little bit and, and uh, get them to buy into what you're doing and, you know, try to get them to give you an opportunity to send some pumpkins in. So that's really how I got started. And I, I guess I just said I was, you know, that was Walmart and that's, you know, where a good amount of my pumpkins go and it, it grew over time. But I, I think growers out there, you know, go down to your local grocery store, go down to your uh, other places with the local movement you know, they'll, they'll interested, they are interested in, in purchasing local. And if you can sell yourself and you have a quality product, I think you get your foot in the door and give them a quality product. I think there's going to be opportunity for you to, to continue growing in that manner. So I, you know, don't be afraid, go, go down and talk to the produce manager and, uh, you know, see what you can do. Gotta stop muting myself. Thank you, Brian. Um, Jeremy, will you speak to that same question, please? Um, yeah, I think a lot along the same lines. Um, just gotta go talk to people. Um, a lot of time, it depends on how big a wholesale you wanna be. Um, the smaller grocery stores, uh, nurseries, stuff like that. Those are you know pretty easy to get into, um, at least to get a meeting. Um, you know, a lot of times I have relationships with other growers, but you know, if you can get the foot in the door, get a face to them and, you know, show them some product, uh, you know, there might be opportunity down the road for it. Um, the bigger, bigger grocers, uh, sometimes, uh, we just use brokers to get into them, um, that are, you know, local produce companies are already running stuff to, you know, Walmart or Kroger. Um, they'll, they get the contracts and then they'll, pass the contracts on to us. We do a lot of contract growing um, for companies like that, not only on pumpkins, but other stuff like that. Um, and uh, that's always been our approach, but a good quality product um, on pumpkins. Uh, the bigger the grocer is, the uh, more boring they want them. They want, you know, your magic wand that's all 15 pounds, perfectly round. 40 in a bin, totally clean, all orange. You can't tell one apart from the other. Um, your bigger or your smaller wholesalers, uh, you know, your nurseries and stuff like that, they like a variety. We plant four or five different varieties together for those customers because they want the tall ones, the skinny ones, the fat ones, you know. Um, so you got to communicate with them and, you know, let them know you can do what they want done. Um, and yeah, that's kind of how we run it. So. Great, thank you. Ken, would you like to add anything about your wholesale business? Um, pretty much like what both the two gentlemen prior to me had said. I We've got away from the chain store business. 
Uh, we basically phased that out in the early 2000s. And uh, we've concentrated on um, basically farm stand and garden centers. And since the, the fall decorating thing has become a big business with, in New England, um, they don't want the cannonball. They don't want the magic wand on the magic lantern. They don't want the chain chain store pumpkin. They want a Kratos. They want a Cronus. They want that we don't have it anymore is the talon on a pumpkin. But we mix up uh, Cronus, uh, Kratos, and we we plan it. Sometimes the Kratos, the Cronus sets well, sometimes it doesn't. But that's what our wholesale customers want. It's a mixture. They want, they don't want cookie cutter. They want something that's different. And, um, you know, we, we averaged last year on wholesale 30 cents a pound. So I thought that was pretty decent because we sell by the pound in the bin. And where I could buy, you know, out of the auction in Pennsylvania, I could buy stuff for 19 cents a pound. But again, it's that cookie cutter chain, chain type pumpkin. And that's not what our, our market demands. It's, it, it varies. You got to know your market. Do your research, learn your market, see what people want and see what people are willing to pay and go from there. Sure. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, so that was uh, great to hear from each of you how you kind of serve different types of wholesale markets. So um, if you're a grower who's considering getting into wholesale, uh, don't feel limited. Uh, it doesn't have to be one specific thing. It could be a combination of things, um, but just um, make some, some connections in your area and have some conversations and it may turn into a big part of your business in the future. All right, um, we'll talk a little bit about roadside stands and farm markets next. Um, I will have Doug speak to that first. Uh, can you share, Doug, some of your most successful merchandising practices and some of the um, best-selling add-on products that you offer at your stand? Yeah, I can do that. I think as a garden center, which they all mentioned that they can sell to, it is like we can't grow enough of the standard pumpkins ourselves. We specialize our own growing on the very unique ones that we can get like $20 a, a, a pumpkin for that is just like the Cinderella and all that. So we rely on wholesalers to grow the boring pumpkins for us and we grow the unique ones that it's harder for the wholesalers to, to grow. So yeah, if you went to a garden center or even a agritourism place that doesn't have as many acreage, like I can't grow enough pumpkins and do good rotation. So um, that's a very good lead to sell pumpkins. And even if that the decorative gourds and all that stuff, there's probably a niche out there with those garden centers. So at our, so at our garden center, if you're just thinking, like there's many ways you can go with the best merchandising, really the most profitable thing you can add to a farm market or whatever would be like a, a place where you're entertaining people with the corn maze, people want to be entertained. So that was revolutionary for us, charging an admission. Um, but, and then as a garden center, the mums are very good add on for us that we, we go, we sell a lot of mums that uh, complement that decorating on the on, on the uh, front porch and corn stalks and all that. But if, if I just had a farm stand, even just the simple um, uh, knives to, to, to cut your pumpkin, you know, there's the knifing kits that a, a lot of people go out the door with the knifing kits. And that, that's, that's the extreme um, complimentary item um, to be at your market. It's just to help them cut a pumpkin, but people are decorating a lot more. So there's a lot of different decoration stuff you can get in, but Thing that pairs best, to, I would say, would be entertaining them as well, and uh, pumpkin knives. Thank you, Doug. Jeremy, I'll ask you a similar question at your um, basic witches stands. How um, have you? How what products have you seen um, perform the best for you at those stands? Um, so the variety pumpkins. Um, Anything that they can't go to the grocery store and buy is what draws them in. And um, our stands are kind of unique because we just uh, we just take a corner of a busy road and we're we live in a big suburban area here. Um, we farm. 
out in the rural area, but we're, we live in the suburban area. And so we just find a busy corner. Um, a lot of times it's kitty corner to a Walmart or a Kroger or something like that and rent the corner from the owner. Um, and then we just take apple bins, put false bottoms in them. And when we pile the pumpkins on top of them and we grow every color, size, shape, specialty pumpkin we can find. And that's what really draws everybody in is they've never seen that kind of variety at a grocery store before. Um, and, you know, the crazy big ones um, like that, uh, the Olympus with big handles, um, you know, just like uh, Doug said, they'll pay $20, $25 for them, not blink an eye. And um, we also have an agritourism place that we sell to that can't grow their own stuff um, because they've been, you know, all their ground that was rented ground, it's all houses now. And same thing, he wants a huge variety and um, the crazier, the better. And that, you know, and that's back to one of my uh, virus things with mosaic virus, stuff with mosaic virus in it, people just love because they've never seen it before and they don't know how it's virus, but it looks cool on the porch. Um, and then add-ons, we we're doing uh, whole ear popcorn uh, which no, you know, very few people have ever seen popcorn on an, on an ear before. I mean, there's not enough in there to have for movie night, but they'll for sure buy a few ears and go show their friends that there's red popcorn, purple popcorn, you know, whatever else. Um, corn stocks are huge. Uh, the big grocers, they can't carry them um, or won't carry them. And, you know, field corn is a dime a dozen. So, we don't even grow our own. We just talk to the neighbor and say, Hey, we'll give you a 500 bucks for that row of corn right there. And they're happy as can be. And we're happier, you know, um, we've seen up here, uh, they're bundling phragmites, which is a weed up here, like a noxious weed, but they're bundling that and selling it at a lot of these stands because it looks cool. Um, we did a lot of straw bells, a lot of small straw bells you can throw in the cars. Um, you know, where we would be selling straw out of a haystack, out of a stack for $5, we're selling for 15 at the stand. Um, and then we also did some carving kits. Um, one thing we run into is if we get into anything crazy, depending on the city we're in, we might have to start charging sales tax, which we don't want to do because that's a whole nother, you know, deal that someone has to take care of. So we try to keep it all farm products. So that's that's kind of what we're selling we're selling winter squash there um yeah so that's what we're carrying awesome thank you jeremy ken or brian would you like to add anything uh, from your retail stands um yeah i guess i can uh we we have we just built the brand new greenhouse range on our store but we used the old greenhouses that were there. We had one greenhouse that was set up with roll up sides and was open and had an open roof. So it was fairly cool in the summer, in the fall. And what we do would do is we'd make displays through there with all the stackable squashes and the funky pumpkins. And, uh, you know, we, we pre-price it and people would walk out with a $60 stack of a Cinderella, a blue doll and a porcelain doll or, or something like that. And, you know, and uh, it, it's crazy what people will buy. Again, they, the, the crazier it looks, the better they buy, it, the more they want it. But getting back, we found when we were using a standard type pumpkin that was injection mold perfect, we sell less of that more of the other varieties, especially a lot of the newer varieties, the taller ones the, the uh, you know, we mix about three varieties together and that's what people want. And they'll pay more than they will at a chain store because it's different. Um, and again, it's all display. We, t we mm -hmm. have a, a, a set thing for $49.99. You get one nine inch mum, a bundle of corn stalks, a straw bale and um, one carving pumpkin and three uh, sugar pumpkins. And that just that just flies all day long so people can decorate their doorstep, their flat uh, fence post, plant post, whatever. And it's the crazier, the better. 
Nice. Yeah, that's a good suggestion, Ken, to have some bundles that are already pre-made that um, people don't have to, to pick it out themselves. It's already put together in a combination. Brian, do you have any final comments about retail? So fall with my retail stand, we used to close it right after Labor Day just due to the large number of pumpkins we do and it, we get so busy on the farm. Uh, the past few years, we've been trying to extend that uh, one of the gals that takes care of that enjoys fall. So she's pushing more for that. And, uh, so she's been taking that and I, you know, just variety, uh, you know, get away from what the box for box stores are selling and, and just, you know, spice it up like the other folks who've been saying. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So we're at the hour and a half mark already. Um, so we got through our panel questions and I will um, pull a couple of questions from the Q&A. We certainly won't get to all of them. Um, we'll do our best to review some of them um, after the webinar and get back to you if we can. Um, but a couple of um, times we had questions about um, washing pumpkins. Uh, can anyone speak to whatever what practices they may use to wash their pumpkins before um, taking them to the market? Any comments from anyone? We're, we just brush ours right out of the field. We try to harvest when it's dry and then we brush them mostly for food safety reasons because I don't want to test wash water and have that risk. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's been our best method. And I know a lot of the people that grow them on rye have better, better uh, what would you say, cleaner pumpkins than what those of us that grow on bare ground do, but yeah. That's been always our method. We try not to wash. Okay, thank so, you. So we don't wash at all. Uh, the no-till gives us an extremely clean pumpkin. Um, our, we'll go through in the morning if there's dew on them and we'll, we'll use loppers to cut them, but we won't handle them until the dew burns off of them. So there's no harvesting if it's, if it's raining or there's still dew on the pumpkins, we won't touch them. But, but once we can start rowing them, uh, we'll roam and we, we handle them when they're, when they're dry. So we, we never wash or, or do anything. So. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, a question that came in for James, do you have any carving size black pumpkins in the works? <laughs> It's a, that is a, a challenging pumpkin to breed for. We've been, my predecessor had, had been breeding pumpkins for decades, had been working on it. I picked up some of the material. We're working on it. It's a challenging one. I would say you're going to see a white pumpkin before you see a black pumpkin. So, but it, it is in the pipeline. All right. And, by, and by, by black, it's really just a really, really dark green pumpkin that holds that green color. So Sure. All right, thank you. Well, we'll still take a carving size white pumpkin. So don't be dis discouraged there. We'll, we'll certainly take those too. Okay. Um, then we had another question about, um, our question would be for Brian. Do you crimp the rye down or do you plant into standing rye? Sure, so we have crimped it before and that's when we had some vetch in it. Um, we've been successful at burning down, uh, earlier and it, it starts to break down just a little bit that it's a little more brittle. And right now we just go through with a planter, uh, and we're, we're doing okay with that. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, about how high is the rye when you're going through and planting? Sure. So once again, we, depending on our plant they, we've gone through when it's pollinating so we've seen rye you know four feet tall uh when we've been planting through it and then we've also seen it knee high uh but like i said we we try to we're gonna do a burn down before we go into it so we've okay. we've been in both of it um once again a learning experience we've we've had problems with it when it was green still and we went through it and it was standing up uh, quite a bit and it, it shaded it out. We had some mice in there and that was eating, eating seeds, uh, which goes back to the learning experience. Don't, don't give up on it. So, but a, a crimper is a good thing. 
a little difficult when you're working with large acreage to, you know, to get everything crimped down. But uh, so far we're, we're doing okay with, without crimping. All right, thank you. All right, so the final question um, that we'll go through is, um, what are some of your favorite varieties? So we'll kind of, we'll go around. I'll start with Jeremy. Can you share some of your favorite pumpkin varieties? Um, yeah, so, oh, just your standard pumpkins to grow. I really like uh, Zeus and Rhea. Those have always been my favorite too. Um, they just do really well for me and they have good handles. Um, I mentioned that we grow a lot of cannonball. We also grow a lot of field trip uh, for the people who are buying uh, pies in bins or singles at the, at the farm stand because they have a better handle and they just look more like a pumpkin. Um, we have a lot of customers that love mini warts. Uh, that's one of their favorite. Um, what else we got in here? We sell a lot of little pumpkin on um, in the boxing market. Uh, and we do grow magic wand uh, for our big grocers. So yeah, those are our, those are our go-tos. And then we have some other big ones that we use and we're going to try the Olympus this year. And we've grown a lot of Cronus in the past and a lot of gladiator also in the past. So. Awesome. Thank you. All right, Doug, same question for you. Favorite varieties. Hey, my two favorite varieties would be field trip is just a awesome pie pumpkin to send with field, uh, literally for the field trip people come through or the pie pumpkins that just the stem is so long and, and, and stays nice and really for a gourd the lunch lady gourd now that's a gourd that we actually can get we do it by weight and we can get I think we're at like 69 cents a pound and we can get 14 to 20 dollars per lunch lady gourd at our garden center so that is uh, one that <clears throat> that grows really big and really well awesome all right, Ken, same question for you. What are some favorite varieties? Um, on a large pumpkin, Kratos is my favorite. Um, then Zeus, again, that's a nice pumpkin. Rhea works well. That's another good pumpkin. And Field Trip, those are, those are my four main staples. Awesome. All right, and Brian, what are your favorites? Sure. So once again, as a wholesaler, you're looking for that 40 count pumpkin so we're using gladiator for that um we're doing a substantial amount of field trips uh we do crystal star as a white 40 45 count and then we're using a big loretta and big doris uh for a jumbo pumpkin right now okay great thank you james i don't know if you'll be able to to pick among your kids you have a favorite couple of varieties as the breeder I mentioned uh, Adonis right off the bat. I, I really, really like that pumpkin, but um, I'm, I'm with Ken for that 40 bin count. I'm a big fan of, of Kratos. I think it's got really beautiful ribbing on it. It's, it's a great looking pumpkin. Uh, for decorative class, I think mini warts is probably my favorite for that, that small decorative. And the main reason is my kids love it. So I bring that one home and they, they just love that little mini wart pumpkin. Awesome, thank you so much. All right. So that will conclude the panel portion of our discussion today. And I will pull the slides back up here and we will um, now announce our raffle winner. So thank you all for joining us um, and, and spending this hour and a half with us to hear from our great panelists. Um, our raffle winner today is Walter Malberg from Michigan. So Walter, you'll be hearing from us via email and you will um, be able to get a thousand seeds of a pumpkin of your choice. So, um, or a, a Harris brand pumpkin of your choice. So we'll um, connect with you after the webinar and uh, make arrangements for that. And um, we, a few reminders for you all as well. The uh, webinar was recorded and it will be available by the end of the week on the Harris Seeds YouTube page. Uh, the new Harris Moran varieties that James featured are available on the Harris Seeds website. Um, there's a specific Harris Moran page where you can find those. And then again, when the webinar concludes, you'll be asked to complete a short survey, and we really appreciate any feedback that you have for mm -hmm. us um, so that it can help us set the direction of future webinars and, and make sure these are the most um, useful to you that they can be. 
Um, so on behalf of Harris Seeds and Harris Brand, we wanna thank our awesome panelists for sharing their time and experience with us today. And thank all of you attendees for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Thanks.